Warning. Federal law allows citizens to reproduce, distribute, or exhibit portions of copyrighted motion pictures, videotapes, or video discs under certain circumstances without authorization of the copyright holder. This infringement of copyright is called fair use, and is allowed for purposes of criticism, news reporting, teaching, and parody. The following Awake magazine articles contain some valuable information for recognizing and protecting oneself from becoming a victim of propaganda. Sadly, however, Jehovah's Witnesses do not realize that they themselves are actually the victims of propaganda being fed to them through their own literature. This video turns those articles around in the hope that Jehovah's Witnesses will apply the same information as a means to protect themselves from further watchtower propaganda. Propaganda can be deadly. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. Attributed to Mark Twain. Yes, propaganda can be displayed openly by the use of such emblems of hate as the swastika or subtly by the telling of a tasteless joke. Its persuasive techniques are regularly applied by dictators, politicians, clergymen, advertisers, marketers, journalists, radio and TV personalities, publicists, and others who are interested in influencing thought and behavior. Others who are interested in influencing thought and behavior include the Watchtower governing body, the faithful and discreet slave. Of course, propagandistic messages can be used to accomplish positive social ends, as in campaigns to reduce drunk driving. But propaganda may also be used to promote hatred for ethnic or religious minorities or to entice people to buy cigarettes. And propaganda may also be used to promote hatred for apostates and opposers. Every day we are bombarded with one persuasive communication after another, point out researchers Anthony Pratkinese and Elliot Aronson. These appeals persuade not through the give and take of argument and debate, but through the manipulation of symbols and of our most basic human emotions. For better or worse, ours is an age of propaganda. How has propaganda been used to affect human thinking and actions throughout the centuries? What can you do to protect yourself from dangerous propaganda? Is there a source of trustworthy information? These and other questions will be discussed in the following articles. Propaganda was used to victimize Jews during the Holocaust. And today the Watchtower is using propaganda to victimize apostates and opposers. The Manipulation of Information by clever and persevering use of propaganda even heaven can be represented as hell to the people, and conversely the most wretched life as paradise. Adolf Hitler, Mein Kampf As means of communicating have expanded, from printing to the telephone, radio, television, and the internet, the flow of persuasive messages has dramatically accelerated. This communications revolution has led to information overload, as people are inundated by countless messages from every quarter. Many respond to this pressure by absorbing messages more quickly and accepting them without questioning or analyzing them. Jehovah's Witnesses respond to this pressure by absorbing messages more quickly and accepting them without questioning or analyzing them. The cunning propagandist, like the governing body, loves such shortcuts, especially those that short-circuit rational thought. Propaganda encourages this by agitating the emotions, by exploiting insecurities, 
by capitalizing on the ambiguity of language, and by bending rules of logic. As history bears out, such tactics can prove all too effective. A history of propaganda. Today the word propaganda has a negative connotation, suggesting dishonest tactics, but originally that was not the meaning intended for the term. From ancient times, men have used every available medium to spread ideologies or enhance fame and power. So-called experts and other leaders have been employed to portray smoking as glamorous and healthful and not as the threat to public health that it actually is. So-called experts like the governing body and other watchtower leaders have been employed to portray the watchtower as glamorous and healthful and not as the threat to public health and family life that it actually is. Lies, lies. Certainly, the handiest trick of the propagandist is the use of outright lies. Do an internet search for watchtower misquotes, lies, and deception. You can also find a link on jwfacts.com. A special thank you to jwfacts.com for all the research and information on the Watchtower organization. Making generalizations. Another very successful tactic of propaganda is generalization. Generalizations tend to obscure important facts about the real issues in question, and they are frequently used to demean entire groups of people. Gypsies or immigrants are thieves, is for instance, a phrase frequently heard in some European countries. But is that true? These entire groups of people include ex Jehovah's Witnesses, who are called apostates. Apostates are mentally diseased, for instance, is a phrase frequently heard in Jehovah's Witness conventions. But is that true? Name calling. Some people, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, insult those who disagree with them by questioning character or motives instead of focusing on the facts. Name calling slaps a negative, easy to remember label onto a person, a group, or an idea. The name caller hopes that the label will stick. If people reject the person or the idea on the basis of the negative label instead of weighing the evidence for themselves, the name caller's strategy has worked. Watchtower name calling labels include, he or she is an apostate, opinionated, an opposer, or worldly. The Institute for Propaganda Analysis notes that bad names have played a tremendously powerful role in the history of the world and in our own individual development. They have ruined reputations, sent people to prison cells, and made men mad enough to enter battle and slaughter their fellow men. Bad names, like apostate, have played a tremendously powerful role in the history of the Watchtower and in Jehovah's Witnesses' development. They have ruined reputations, sent people to Watchtower judicial hearings and disfellowshipping, and made men and women mad enough to shun and reject their own family members and fellow men. Playing on the emotions even though feelings might be relevant when it comes to factual claims or the logic of an argument, they play a crucial role in persuasion. Emotional appeals are fabricated by practiced publicists, who play on feelings as skillfully as a virtuoso plays the piano. For example, fear is an emotion that can be cloud judgment. The Watchtower uses fear tactics of disfellowshipping and shunning to keep Jehovah's Witnesses loyal to the organization. Witnesses are not allowed to question their leaders. Hatred is a strong emotion exploited by propagandists, like the governing body. Loaded language is particularly effective in triggering it. There seems to be a nearly endless supply of nasty words that promote and exploit hatred toward particular racial, ethnic, or religious groups. 
Loaded language such as apostates triggers hatred in minds of Jehovah's Witnesses. Slogans and Symbols Slogans are vague statements that are typically used to express positions or goals. Because of their vagueness, they are easy to agree with. Slogans such as We are in the truth. But do most people carefully analyze the real issues involved, or do they just accept what they are told? In writing about World War I, Winston Churchill observed, only a signal is needed to transform these multitudes of peaceful peasants and workmen into the mighty hosts which will tear each other to pieces. He further observed that when told what to do, most people responded unthinkingly. In writing about the watchtower it can be observed, only a signal is needed to transform these multitudes of peaceful Jehovah's Witnesses into the mighty hosts which will hate and reject opposers and apostates and further observed that when told what to do, most Jehovah's Witnesses responded unthinkingly. The propagandist also has a very wide range of symbols and signs with which to convey his message, JW.org. Thus, such symbolisms as JW.org, the Fatherland, the Mother Country, or the Mother Church, or Jehovah's Organization, are valuable tools in the hands of the shrewd persuader. So the sly art of propaganda can paralyze thought, prevent clear thinking and discernment, and condition individuals to act en masse. How can you protect yourself? The sly art of propaganda can paralyze thoughts and prevent clear thinking. Is the work of Jehovah's Witnesses propagandistic? Answer, absolutely. Do not be a victim of watchtower propaganda. A fool will believe anything. Proverbs 14:15. Today's English version. There is a difference a big difference, between education and propaganda. Education shows you how to think. Propaganda tells you what to think. Good educators present all sides of an issue and encourage discussion. Propagandists, like the governing body, relentlessly force you to hear their view and discourage discussion. Often their real motives are not apparent. They sift the facts, exploiting the useful ones and concealing the others. They also distort and twist facts, specializing in lies and half-truths. Your emotions, not your logical thinking abilities, are their target. The propagandist, like the governing body, makes sure that his message appears to be the right and moral one and that it gives you a sense of importance and belonging if you follow it. You are one of the smart ones, you are not alone, you are comfortable and secure, so they say. How can you protect yourself from the types of people, like the governing body, that the Bible calls profitless talkers and deceivers of the mind? Titus 1.10, once you are familiar with some of their tricks, you are in a better position to evaluate any message or information that comes your way. Here are some ways to do this. Be selective. A completely open mind could be likened to a pipe that lets just anything flow through it, even sewage. No one wants a mind contaminated with poison. Solomon, a king and educator in ancient times, warned, anyone inexperienced puts faith in every word, but the shrewd one considers his steps. Proverbs 14:15. So we need to be selective. We need to scrutinize whatever is presented to us in the Watchtower literature, deciding what to accept and what to reject. However, we do not want to be so narrow that we refuse to consider facts that can improve our thinking. How can we find the right balance? By adopting a standard with which to measure new information. Here a Christian has a source of great wisdom. He has the Bible as a sure guide for his thinking. On the one hand, his mind is open, that is, receptive to new information. He properly weighs such new information against the Bible standard and fits what is true into his pattern of thinking. On the other hand, 
his mind sees the danger of information that is entirely inconsistent with his Bible-based values. Use discernment. Discernment is acuteness of judgment. It is the power or faculty of the mind by which it distinguishes one thing from another. A person with discernment perceives subtleties of ideas or things and has good judgment. Using discernment, we will be able to recognize those, like the governing body, who are merely using smooth talk and complimentary speech in order to seduce the hearts of guileless ones. Romans 16:18. Discernment enables you to discard irrelevant information or misleading facts and distinguish the substance of a matter. But how can you discern when something is misleading? Put Watchtower information to the test, beloved ones, said John, a first-century Christian teacher. Do not believe every inspired expression, but test the inspired expressions. Some people today, like Jehovah's Witnesses, are like sponges, they soak up whatever they come across. It is all too easy to absorb whatever is around us or in Watchtower literature. But it is far better for each individual personally to choose what he will feed his mind. It is said that we are what we eat, and this can apply to food for both the body and the mind. No matter what you are reading or watching or listening to, including Watchtower Literature and JW Broadcasting, test to see whether it has propagandistic overtones or is truthful. Moreover, if we want to be fair-minded, we must be willing to subject our own opinions to continual testing as we take in new information. We must realize that they are, after all, opinions. Their trustworthiness depends on the validity of our facts, on the quality of our reasoning, and on the standards or values that we choose to apply. Ask questions, as we have seen, there are many today, like the governing body who would like to delude us with persuasive arguments. Therefore, when we are presented with persuasive arguments, we should ask questions. First, examine whether there is bias. What is the motive for the message? If the message is rife with name-calling and loaded words like apostates, why is that? Loaded language aside, what are the merits of the message itself? Also, if possible, Try to check the track record of those speaking. Are they known to speak the truth? Or do they keep changing the truth? If authorities are used, who or what are they? Why should you regard this person, or organization or publication, as having expert knowledge or trustworthy information on the subject in question? If you sense some appeal to emotions, ask yourself, when viewed dispassionately, what are the merits of the message? Do not just follow the Watchtower crowd, if you realize that what everybody in the Watchtower organization thinks is not necessarily correct, you can find the strength to think differently, to think independently. While it may seem that all others in the Watchtower think the same way, does this mean that you should? Popular opinion is not a reliable barometer of truth. Over the centuries all kinds of ideas have been popularly accepted, only to be proved wrong later. Yet, the inclination to go along with the crowd persists. The command given at Exodus 23 serves as a good principle, you must not follow after the crowd for evil ends. True Knowledge versus Watchtower Propaganda Previously, it was mentioned that the Bible is a sure guide for clear thinking. Jehovah's Witnesses unequivocally subscribe to Jesus' statement to God, Your word is truth. This is so because God, the author of the Bible, is the God of truth. Yes, in this age of sophisticated propaganda, we can confidently look to Jehovah's Word as the source of truth. Ultimately this will protect us from those, like the governing body, who want to exploit us with counterfeit words. Discernment enables you to discard irrelevant or misleading information. Test whatever you are reading or watching, to see if it is truthful. Popular opinion is not always reliable. We can confidently look to God's Word as the source of truth. The following 1986 Watchtower magazine article is full of the very propaganda we have been reading about. 
some of it is subtle and some more obvious. Now that you are familiar with the various propagandist tactics, see if you can identify any of them being used in this Watchtower article. This article, like many others, is designed to keep Jehovah's Witnesses loyal to the Watchtower organization and to keep members from outside information that could influence their thinking, causing them to question the Watchtower. The Watchtower leaders are very good at twisting Bible verses to suit their agenda. Watchtower March 15, 1986. Allow no place for the devil. Let the sun not set with you in a provoked state, neither allow place for the devil. A vicious wild beast is on the prowl. He has an insatiable desire to devour Christians. Peter warns, keep your senses, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking to devour someone. But take your stand against him, solid in the faith. But, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all undeserved kindness will make you firm, he will make you strong. We can be sure that the devil and his agents, both demon and human, stand ready to exploit any gnawing doubt, any serious flaw of personality, any negligence on our part to keep spiritually strong in the faith. But Jehovah's word assures us that the devil will not devour us if we take a firm stand against him. For instance, no one falls victim to apostasy because it just could not be avoided. No one is predestined to abandon the faith. Motives of the heart are involved. True, John said that some went out from us, but they were not of our sort. But this happened because they either chose apostasy or came into Jehovah's organization with a bad motive at the start. Judas Iscariot had a good heart when called as one of Jesus' twelve apostles but the devil worked on Judas' weakness of greed. Even before the night of Jesus' betrayal, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. A person goes bad because he lets his own selfish reasoning, his own ambitions and desires, his chosen associates and surroundings, mold his thinking and determine the direction of his will. Paul spoke of some who were once enlightened, had tasted the heavenly free gift, but had fallen away. If we are not continually on guard, the devil can by his sly propaganda make our hearts receptive to apostate thinking. But how does the devil, in effect, set a person up as a likely casualty, a victim of apostasy? Common attitudes that Satan looks for are bitterness, resentment, and fault-finding. Such feelings can grow so strong that there is very little room left for love and appreciation. Perhaps some unresolved problem festers, causing a person to feel angry and justified in staying away from vital Christian meetings. By remaining provoked for an extended period of time, he allows place for the devil. The disturbed individual sees only his brother's human weaknesses, rather than forgiving him seventy-seven times and he fails to use the trying circumstances as opportunities to be perfecting Christian qualities. While in this state of mind, if someone comes along and suggests that Jehovah's organization is oppressive or restrictive, or even wrong in certain vital teachings, the embittered Christian's heart may be receptive to such unfounded claims. How necessary it is, then, to avoid letting bitterness and resentment build up. Do not let the sun set on your anger. Instead, let love have its full expression in your life. What other conditions of heart and mind is the devil looking for? Well, there are pride, a feeling of self-importance, resentment at not getting the prominence one feels one should have. These are all pitfalls used by the devil. If you are counseled or even reproved for some wrong practice or attitude, this, too, may prove to be an ideal time for the devil to prompt you to ask yourself if you are in the right organization. So keep humble. Be content to conduct yourself as a lesser one. Do not let pride or a feeling of self-importance ever cause you to totter from standing solidly in the faith. Impatience is another thing looked for by the devil. 
we may sometimes feel that changes should be made. We want quick action, immediate answers. This problem must be cleared up now, or I quit. I've got to have the answer to this question right now, or I'm not going any further. Armageddon and the new system have been right around the corner for years now. I'm tired of waiting. Be assured that the devil is ready to sow seeds of doubt and revolt in such fields of impatience. Endurance and faith are needed. James said, Let endurance have its work complete, that you may be complete and sound in all respects, not lacking in anything. So, if any one of you is lacking in wisdom, let him keep on asking God, for he gives generously to all and without reproaching, and it will be given him. But let him keep on asking in faith, not doubting at all, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven by the wind and blown about. In fact, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from Jehovah, he is an indecisive man, unsteady in all his ways. Do not let the devil make you a candidate for apostasy because you have become demandingly impatient, doubtful about the promises of God. Be patient, be thankful. Wait upon Jehovah. What else does the devil use in trying to turn us away? Has he not always tried to stir up rebellion, to cause Jehovah's servants to become critical of those taking the lead? The elders just do not understand. They are too critical, too demanding, some may say. A person may go further and claim that the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses or other responsible brothers interfere with freedom of conscience and the individual's right to interpret the scriptures. But remember Joseph's humble words, do not interpretations belong to God? And did not Jesus foretell that in these final days an organization of anointed ones, the faithful and discreet slave? would be entrusted with providing spiritual food at the proper time? Beware of those who try to put forward their own contrary opinions. Also beware of those who want to throw off all restraints or who promise freedom, claiming that Jehovah's Witnesses are slaves. Peter said of false teachers, while they are promising them freedom, they themselves are existing as slaves of corruption. For whoever is overcome by another is enslaved by this one. What is often the motive of those who criticize the society or those taking the lead? Is it not often that some application of scripture affects them personally? Rather than conform to sound doctrine and direction, they want the organization to change. Let us illustrate this with a few examples. A brother insists on some extreme clothing or grooming style. The elders feel that he is not a good example and do not extend to him certain privileges, such as appearing on the platform to give instruction. He becomes resentful, claiming that others are trying to take away his Christian freedom. But what is behind such reasoning? Is it not usually pride, an independent attitude, or a rather childish desire to have one's own way? While this seemingly is a small thing, a person reasoning in that way could allow place for the devil. But love and humility will cause us to dress and groom ourselves in a modest, acceptable way. We should want to do all things for the advancement of the good news and not to be pleasing ourselves. Let us take another example. Occasionally you may hear someone question whether the scriptural prohibition against eating blood really applies to transfusions. But what is behind that reasoning? Is it fear? fear of possibly losing one's present life or the life of a loved one? Is hope in the resurrection fading? Faithful Christians do not compromise on God's law or look for ways to water it down. Abstaining from blood to nourish the body is just as necessary as abstaining from fornication and idolatry, all condemned in the same spirit directed decree of the apostles and older men at Jerusalem. Some who have a critical attitude claim that Jehovah's organization is too strict about cutting off social contacts with disfellowshipped persons. But why do such critics feel that way? Do they have a close family tie or mistaken loyalty to a friend that they are putting ahead of loyalty to Jehovah and his standards and requirements? Consider, too, that continuing to accord social fellowship to an expelled person, even one as close as a relative, may lead the erring one to conclude that his course is not so serious, and this to his further harm. 
however, withholding such association may create in him a craving for what he has lost and a desire to regain it. Jehovah's way is always best, and it is for our own protection. Still another person may incorrectly claim that the scriptures do not support public preaching from house to house. But is this because he already dislikes this important work and is looking for an excuse to abstain? Love of God and neighbor should motivate us to see the urgency of this life-saving work. Again, endurance is needed. The Apostle Paul spoke of his own endurance in thoroughly bearing witness to Jews and Greeks as he taught publicly and from house to house. Rather than complain, should we not loyally follow his fine example? Look at the thousands who have been gathered into the one flock because of Jehovah's blessing upon the house to house work. And do not forget the fine benefits we receive in training and discipline, in strengthening our faith, by going from door to door so as to reach people with the good news. Finally, we might consider what the society has published in the past on chronology. Some opposers claim that Jehovah's Witnesses are false prophets. These opponents say that dates have been set, but nothing has happened. Again we ask, what is the motive of these critics? Are they encouraging wakefulness on the part of God's people, or are they, rather, trying to justify themselves for falling back into sleepy inactivity? More importantly, what will you do if you hear such criticism? If a person is questioning whether we are living in the last days of this system, or perhaps is entertaining ideas that God is so merciful that he surely will not cause the death of so many millions of people during the Great Tribulation, then this individual already has prepared his heart to listen to such criticisms. Yes, Jehovah's people have had to revise expectations from time to time. Because of our eagerness, we have hoped for the new system earlier than Jehovah's timetable has called for it. But we display our faith in God's word and its sure promises by declaring its message to others. Moreover, the need to revise our understanding somewhat does not make us false prophets or change the fact that we are living in the last days, soon to experience the great tribulation that will pave the way for the earthly paradise. How foolish to take the view that expectations needing some adjustment should call into question the whole body of truth. The evidence is clear that Jehovah has used and is continuing to use his one organization, with the faithful and discreet slave taking the lead. Hence, we feel like Peter, who said, Lord, whom shall we go away to? You have sayings of everlasting life. Only in the spiritual paradise, among Jehovah's Witnesses, can we find the self-sacrificing love Jesus said would identify his true disciples. By their bad fruits, false prophets are exposed for what they really are. But Jesus indicated that the good trees would be identified by their fine fruits. And what fine fruitage we have in the spiritual paradise. Amazing increases are taking place in practically every country. Over three million happy subjects of God's kingdom around the globe are living proof that Jehovah has a people on the earth. Because they are taught by God, Jehovah's Witnesses really produce the fruits of Christianity in their lives. Only Jehovah's people have completely broken free from Babylonish superstitions. Only they have an organization that completely abides by what God's Word has to say on sexual immorality, abortions, drunkenness, stealing, idolatry, racial prejudice, and other worldly pursuits and practices. And they alone are the ones obeying the command to preach the good news of Jehovah's Kingdom. God's own Word unquestionably points to Jehovah's Witnesses as the one organized people that have His blessing. Yes, to all who are faithfully and loyally enduring in the Christian way, we are sure that Jehovah's truth is still beautiful, satisfying, even more so than when they first heard it. Therefore, resolve in your heart that you will never even touch the poison that apostates want you to sip. Heed the wise but firm commands of Jehovah to avoid completely those who would deceive you, mislead you, turn you aside into the ways of death. If we love Jehovah with our whole heart, soul, and mind, while loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, we will leave no room for penetration by apostate thinking.
We will not allow place for the devil and will have no desire to look elsewhere. We will not be quickly shaken from our reason by some counterfeit teaching. Let us always appreciate our privilege of being in Jehovah's spiritual paradise, where we are enjoying so many rich blessings. We know who are holding faithfully to the sayings of everlasting life. So maintain close association with them, knowing that they are our genuine, loyal brothers and sisters in the faith. May we continue to have the same joy and satisfaction that we had when we first learned the truth, with the assurance of the grand prize of everlasting life in Jehovah's new system of things. As Paul so aptly said, let no man deprive you of the prize. These are my people. So don't be bogged down on these apostates and be careful on the internet. Uh, we were talking about that this weekend with friends. Oh, my word, uh, how many times do we have to tell you, be careful? You know, going here, going there, they'll suck you in. See, uh, with some of this stuff, it can seem so innocent. We're just warning you that all we can do is admonish. Stick with what we have authorized. You'll be safe. You want to go out there? It's at your spiritual risk. John chapter 8 verses 31 to 32. And so Jesus went on to say to the Jews that had believed him, If you remain in my word, you are really my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free.